Good morning. I'm going to put my little object lesson on the corner of the podium. I know last week Brother Christopher had all kinds of goodies that he got from the produce department as he was speaking about fruit and fruitfulness and fruit bearing. And I don't want you to think that today I'm going to redo his message or try to improve on it. Uh, you may not be aware of what a prevalent subject fruit and fruitfulness is when it comes to the scripture. And uh, I just want to rehearse a couple of things. Uh, it's, it's really kind of crazy. Uh, I so often will mention things that we've talked about in Sunday school before our service. And this morning we were in Second Peter chapter 1. And kind of interesting that the subject of fruit and fruitfulness came up uh, in Second Peter chapter 1. Uh, that we can be guaranteed of our fruitfulness. Um, oh, maybe before I go there, may, maybe I better explain what we're talking about. But uh, did, did you know that in the very opening of Scripture, the subject of bearing fruit, well, let, let's, even, let's even say it more exacting. The very first words that we have in the Bible, from God to man, Anybody want to try that? What, what's the very first thing that God said to man? Okay. Be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> well, be, be fruitful. Yes. And, and I know there's more to that verse. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and so forth. And I think that many times we have this idea that it's talking about having kids and raising a family. When I really believe that the exhortation... The encouragement to be fruitful means that God is looking for something from our lives. And can I use the word produce? I, when we go to the produce department at the grocery store, we're there amongst all the fruit and veggies, and I, I hope you're eating your fruit and vegetables. Uh, I, I don't want to get too paternal up here this morning, but uh, uh, they're essential to our well-being but the bearing of fruit that you and I produce by our life and living things that are an asset and a benefit not only to others and that our lives benefit and help them but in the regard of God himself we're made in his image and likeness and he's a fruitful God and we are to reflect his glory, we are to reflect his virtues and, and the wonderful things that we know of him by our own lives. And God looks for that in our lives. We're in Matthew chapter 13 this morning. And if you would please turn there, we're going to pick this subject up. I've got a microphone that's doing that pop, pop, pop thing, so I'm going to try to stay away from it a bit here. Matthew chapter 13. The same day went Jesus out of the house and... Oh, that's better. <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah, if I were to sneeze into this thing, I'd probably hurt somebody's ears. The same day went Jesus out of the house and he sat by the seaside. And a great crowd, the word multitude there... Great multitudes were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and he sat and the whole crowd stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, and he starts his first story. Behold, a sower, a person who does planting, went forth to plant, went forth to so, uh, let's, let's take a look at these introductory verses here for just a moment. Um, Jesus is increasing in his popularity. Uh, not that that's what he was really looking for 
for popularity's sake, but in the regard of his audience and those that were listening to the truth that he taught, they were increasing. And he was seeing real success in his ministry. Huge crowds gathering together. We're going to read about stories that number in the thousands. Uh, the story of him feeding the multitudes, as we know with the loaves and the fishes. And this is a time when his ministry is experiencing real growth. And these crowds were gathering together, and in this case, uh, they're at the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus, because of the size of the crowd, and I think that there was another factor involved, um, he entered into a boat, a boat that was there, and he actually taught, he lectured, he preached from the ship, from the boat. Now keep in mind that when the scripture uses the word ship, we're not talking about an ocean liner or something of the size that we maybe stand uh, on the shores of Lake Michigan and we go like, look at the size of that ship. No, we're, we're talking about fishing boats. We're talking about commercial grade, uh, smaller boats that here Jesus is standing in the boat. Um, something kind of unique. He's using, I believe, he's using the water not only as a backdrop, but as support for his ability to be heard. Um, I suppose many of us have been at the lake, not, not Lake Michigan, but a smaller lake in the evening when perhaps a couple is out in their little fishing boat. And the crazy thing is, they're out there just talking to one another. And you're standing on the shore. I have no idea how many feet away, but my goodness, it's almost like they're on a loudspeaker. You can hear clearly what they're saying. And uh, I guess whenever I'm out in the boat, I'm awful careful about what I say because I wonder what people on shore are able to take from, from, what I've, from what I've uttered. Well, here he is, and the crowd is gathered together. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by hills, and I can see the audience gathered together on the hillside. Jesus in the boat, using the backdrop of the Sea of Galilee to help him and, and help the carrying of his voice. And the audience is sitting down and listening to him as he teaches. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is he spoke and he used this method of teaching as a, as a predominant method, speaking in parables. Uh, another word that we could use this morning is he spoke to them using illustrations. Now, let me just give you why that's important and how that works. Uh, very obviously, someone could stand in this pulpit and just teach truth. Just one Bible doctrine after another after another, and that can become quite tedious. And I have to say that in such a setting, and some of you have been there, you've had school teachers, some of you have attended lectures where at the end of it, so much information came across from the instructor that in the end, somebody said, well, what was that all about? And you go like, man, I'm telling you, he lost me. Uh, he or she uh, should have used illustrations because you know what you'll do? Especially if they're good illustrations. You'll remember the story that was told. And then if someone were to say to you, well, yeah, but uh, he used that story in what context? Well, uh, teaching this particular important factor or truth and used the illustration, the go along with para Ball, so that you, even if you didn't um, maybe get the message, you got the story, and then you could apply that story to the truth, and it's, it's just one of the absolute best methods, and I guess I'm not surprised that Jesus used parables to communicate his message, to convey truth. So here's the beginning of the story. A sower goes forth to sow. Now, I grew up on the farm, and we had machinery for that. And uh, yet, through our farm, there was a small and 
depends on how you say it, creek or crick. I heard somebody the other day talking about Battle Creek, and they said Battle Crick, and I'm going like, that's a little different. Well, uh, we we had a crick. My dad said, and he was from he was from the west, but we had a crick going through our farm, and it was crooked. It went around through, and many of the places on our field plots that you couldn't access with machinery, my dad gave me an apron, a seed apron, and he would, depending on what I was going to sow, plant, he would fill that apron with, with oat seed or rye seed or wheat seed. Uh, we never used, we never used this method for corn. Corn was always planted with uh, an instrument, even if, you know, doing it by hand. Uh, you planted each, uh, each corn seed in such a way that it followed the particular row of corn. And um, this is a, a method that's called broadcasting. Yeah, broadcasting, just like, just like the news, okay? Uh, but what you would do, you would reach into the seed apron and you would grab a handful of the seed and you used your, your hand as well as the gaps between your fingers to cast, to broadcast the seed out into those difficult areas. And in fact, if you got very good at judging the weather and the wind, you could also use the wind to assist you. Kind of an old method of planting grain and, and different other items. So I, I'm kind of familiar with this, but um, the farms or the agricultural plots of Jesus' day were not like what we see in the agricultural communities around us today. Most of the people that were involved in planting and then, of course, in harvesting the fruit or the produce that they had planted, uh, they would live in the city and they would either own or they would lease a parcel of ground and they, I'll never forget flying over Tokyo, Japan. Um, it's really something when you get up in the air there and you look down on the small farms and the color of the, of the plots of land and the difference in the shades of the colors as different crops are planted there and each one of those areas has a border or a boundary. And in Bible days, many of those boundaries and borders were denoted by, by either a stone hedge or by a pathway that would separate your seed plot, your parcel of ground from your neighbor and you would work in such a way that you would keep your business separate from theirs. And, and by the way, that all fits into this story. We're, we're going to talk about seed that in the process of broadcasting ended up on the pathway. Uh, we're going to talk about seed that ended up amongst the stones. We're going to talk about seed that got caught up in weeds and so forth. And you can only imagine that in this method of, of farming, in this agricultural age of which Jesus taught, um, that these different characteristics having to do with sowing, planting, were familiar items. And Jesus is using this illustration because in an effort to make sure that his point is understood, he wants to talk about things that his audience is familiar with. I, I'm a retired mechanic, and um, I find myself talking, well, before I worked as a mechanic, um, being a mechanic was kind of a hobby with me, and uh, I get the magazines, and I try to stay up on some of the stuff that's going on today, and yet when I talk about different automobile components, uh, depending on my audience, I'll have people that look at me like, oh, come on, talk to me about something that I know. Explain this to me in, in terms that I'm familiar with, and, 
and so forth. And um, if you don't, you can lose your audience. And of course, Jesus has very important truth to communicate. Let me, let me step aside here for just a moment and you'll see the two signs on either side of the church. There used to be one over there that said living with a kingdom mentality. And I think, I think I still have that poster at home. I'm going to try to find it. And um, this is the first of seven different parables that Jesus is going to talk about. Seven different go along with the lesson stories. And I believe that this particular story, the parable of the planter, of the sower, reflects on the other parables that will follow. And I believe that why this is told first, and in fact, he even clarifies, he says, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand all parables? So Jesus is using this initial story to begin a subject of what it means to live life in a way that matters, in a way where who you are, what you do, and the different aspects of your character and everything about you has a positive effect on the world around you. That's what God has called us to. So before he gets into the other stories about the kingdom, he uses this story about fruitfulness, about bearing fruit, about being productive in life. And this will reflect upon the meaning of the other stories that follow. We're, we're going to only have time for this story this morning, but uh, you'll see as you read along, there are six other parables, and they don't all have to do with planting and reaping. Uh, however, there are several others that have to do with seed. But used to illustrate a different point. Um, we'll explain that as we go along. Um, there are a lot of ways to, to illustrate these parables, and there are a lot of ways to interpret them, and I've read Bible commentaries that aligned these seven parables with the plagues of Egypt and with the seven seals of the book of Revelation and with the seven this or the seven that. I, I, I have to tell you that when I read some of those commentaries, I get lost. And I, I really think that a commentary should help you, not uh, uh, cause you to find yourself in the fog. So we're going to be simple as we explain the particular characteristics of these parables and how they identify things pertaining to the kingdom. And it's important. You know, if you don't understand kingdom living, if you don't understand this concept of a bigger picture, of a grander viewpoint, your life is going to be very, very narrow, and it's only going to be about you and what you do and the parameters of your involvement in life. And, and I have to be honest with you, that's a pretty small way to live. If you see yourself as a parcel of ground into which God has invested, has invested seed, has invested himself for the benefit of this grandiose picture, this viewpoint of everything pertaining to an everlasting kingdom that God is establishing and that he will fulfill in a coming day. If, if you get this big picture, I'm telling you, it will change the way you perceive virtually everything in your experience. And... I, I, I'm going to say this, and I, I, I'm going to say this with caution. Life is more than getting a PhD. Uh, life is more than finding a career 
that is going to get you through to your retirement. Um, I, I have friends that grew up in particular families where everyone in their family worked for a particular industry and, and such, and they thought, you know, I've got it made, and uh, grandpa retired from Ford Motor Company, and my dad retired from Ford or whatever, and blah, 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 and I thought that being a tool and die man uh, would, would be the thing that I could learn that would get me through to the end of my career, and machines have taken over tool and die. And not only that, foreign companies have taken over some of our otherwise domestic industries. And I had a friend that was, he was a designer for Ford Motor Company, and in fact his father was an engine designer, and Ford sent him to China. Now there's nothing wrong with going to China. Uh, and there he was for six years in China, and while he was in China, he was traded or sold I mean, it almost sounds like slavery here to three other huge corporations. And now he's back here in Michigan working for a company, of, and it's still related to what he was doing uh, over in, in Shanghai, but he's working for a company now in Holland, Michigan, making computer switches and components. And I have to be honest with you, all of this dickering and dealing and swapping him around, he said to me, he says, this has really affected my retirement. I, can I just say to you this morning that if you're looking for stability and if you're looking for something solid, something sure, set your perspective on the kingdom of God because it's everlasting and anything and everything that you may do in the process of finding out where you are and where you belong and where you will end up in God's kingdom I, I want you to know that those things, if they are trusted to the Lord, you will find success in virtually everything that you set your mind or put your hand to. So, uh, living with a kingdom mentality, seeing behind everything and over everything, this perspective, this viewpoint, of God's eternal plan and finding out where you fit in. Okay? I, 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 if you've never heard that before, I hope that this morning that has challenged you to perceive yourself, your future, and everything about you in a different light, in a different way. Behold, a sower went forth to sow. He's out there in his seed plot. He's got a handful of grain, a handful of seed, and when he sowed some seed fell by the wayside. It fell on the pathway. And the, the fowls, the birds, came and ate them. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what's going on here. This man is planting seed, looking for production, looking for a crop. He's not out scattering seed to feed the birds. Duh. Okay? And we'll explain a little bit more about that. But um, how disappointing when you've invested in good seed, and, and we're going to find out what the seed is, and as you cast it, some goes on the walkway where everybody's going to just trample it under if the birds don't get it first. Verse 5 says, some fell upon stony ground or stony places where they didn't have a lot of soil. They didn't have much earth. And right away they sprang up. And that shouldn't surprise you. We're, we're going to find out that this is good seed, okay? Nothing wrong with the seed. The seed springs up, it sprouts, as we would say, but in shallow soil, yes, that would contribute to the seed. You know, if you plant a seed deep, it's gonna take longer for it to pop up through the ground than if it's in shallow soil, but <clears throat> when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. 
not good, okay? You don't have to be a horticulturist to figure out that this is not a desirable thing to have happen to your investment of seed. Some fell amongst thorns and we'll just say weeds and the thorns sprang up and choked them. Now I, I've seen this. I've seen where different and we use the, the word invasive species, okay? And all it takes in a field of grain is for some crazy weed that's been doing good in the vicinity to blow some seed over into your, into your field plot. And next thing you know, where you had planted wheat, You've got cocklebur or some other crazy ragweed or something growing up there. And believe me, weeds and thorns and thistles. By the way, be careful as you handle thorns and thistles. But the one thing that you'll find is that the stalk of them is very watery, very juicy. You know why that is? They drink all the water that's in the ground. They drink it right up. And wheat which is quite hollow and, and, and so forth, uh, gets starved of the nutrients and of the water that it needs in order to grow properly. And in no time, you have thorns and thistles and other weeds, invasive species that will just overcome what you're trying to accomplish. But other fell on good ground. That's verse 8. And brought forth fruit, brought forth, it produced some a hundred times as much, some 60 times as much, some 30 times as much. Now, I got a cob of corn here. And you know, the last time that we spoke about sowing and reaping, uh, I had a strange looking thing that looked kind of like this. No, okay, no corn cob. And by the way, that was a that was a full year. When I say full year, it was a complete year. And if you look down in there, here was this thing that looked like a thin piece of cork and it had one or two seeds on it. What a disappointment. If you don't plan that in planting one seed, you're going to get back two. I, I'm going to hand this around. Emma, would you come on up and get this? And don't try to count these. Uh, the rows of the corn are kind of, And by the way, if you're wondering about the color of this, this is Indian popcorn, okay? And uh, but anyway, take that and pass it around. But you can only imagine how many seed yeah, don't try to eat it. You'll tear up your teeth. But you, you can only imagine how many seed there are on that ear of corn. Let, let me just tell you something. And I know you know this. You've got a little bit of horticultural experience. That came about with one seed. In fact, likely, the corn stalk that that grew on had as many as three, but usually at least two ear of corn growing on it and the individual who planted, by the way that was planted by my grandma, the individual who planted that single seed of popcorn got back as much perhaps as 300 times, 300 fold. That's pretty good crop. You got, you got enough popcorn there for two or three popcorn parties. A couple of video movies. But again, when you are in the business of producing, when you're in the business of sowing and reaping, of planting for the purpose of a crop, that's what you want. I've seen ears of corn in a bad year that were only about this long. And in fact, the seed that was growing on them were so pathetic, I'm not sure that if you planted them, you could use them as seed to grow another crop. On the other hand, I've seen times where ears of corn in a farmer's field were that long and they had 
kernels of corn all the way to the end. Now let's just suggest that as a farmer who you've hired somebody to come and plant your fields, harvest time comes, and what you have planted is made up of all of those huge, those large, full ears of corn, and you send the harvesting equipment out there to, to we call it, combine them, you're going to have semi-trucks full of corn if you've got those kind of ear. On the other hand, if you've got those other... A few years ago when we had that bad drought, I saw farms in my neighborhood where the farmer realized they were not going to produce enough corn to make it worth his while to go out and harvest them. And he went out with a chopping machine and turned it into silage, insolage, because he knew that that corn was not going to produce what he originally intended. How disappointing to have invested huge money for a crop and in the end for the, the outcome of all of your labor to be so small that it's not even worth going out and involving yourself in the work of harvesting it. Verse 9, and this is not a pun as I hand around an ear of corn, but Jesus says, if you've got ears to listen, listen up. Okay? And the disciples came and they said unto him, why are you talking to them in parables? What? You're, you're telling these stories. I mean, and, and they may have even thought in the back of their mind, do you really think that these thousands of people that have come to hear you came to hear you talk about plant in the garden? And he responded and he said unto them, because it's given unto you to know the mysteries, those difficult things of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Now there are some of you sitting here this morning and as I'm looking into your face, and I know I make you uncomfortable when I do that, I've had people say, Pastor, you're always looking right at me, you know, I'm looking at everybody else too, okay? But you're listening. And the very fact that you're listening, and I'm telling this pithy, pardon the term, but story about planting, and you may have, as you walked in here, thought, you know, we did that when I was in first grade. We put a seed in the bottom of a Dixie cup and put it in the window of our classroom, and it grew. And I gave it to Mother for Mother's Day. And I thought, no, no I, we're talking about something much greater, much deeper, more intense in understanding than just the common one, two, threes of planting and sprouting and then seeing the outcome. We're talking about the kingdom. This is huge. This is infinite in its enormity. This is, this is the biggest thing going and some of you, as I've been talking, and maybe it's because I had a, an ear of popcorn I'm handing around, uh, you've taken an interest. But if you understand at the end of this service what this story about planting and harvesting is all about, if, if as we say, you get it, you will have in your understanding information that not only will affect and change your life but will bring success and blessing to you from the moment that you <clears throat> allow that seed that I planted in this sermon to get into your thinking and to go from your thoughts into your heart and affect you in the very outcome and purpose of your life. And Jesus, and by the way, notice when, when he says this, he's responding to those that are asking questions. 
And I want to encourage you, and, and I'm going to say there is no such thing as a bad question. There's no such thing as a stupid question when it comes to the Word of God. How else are you going to learn? If you've got questions, we invite you to come and ask. And it's those that ask that receive. It's those that seek who find. It's those that knock, and I'm speaking about opportunities and so forth, that opportunities open. And we had that in chapter 6. Remember? Okay. I've got, I've got to start handing out things again. i got my bag of stuff here. But, um, I, I, I just, I want to get to my point here. If you're interested and if you're inquiring, if you're asking, if you're seeking, if you're wondering, what is this little story about planting a garden all about anyway? Why did Jesus, you know, why did he bother? He was letting his audience understand that life is more than the stuff that you and I see. It goes much deeper than that. And the results and all of the issues of life are not just about living for today. So he said to those that ask unto you, those of you that are inquiring, those of you that are interested, unto you is given to know or to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. But these others that came to just see what the show was, and by the way, Jesus did some pretty cool things. I mean, he healed the sick, gave sight to the blind, he multiplied this and that and so forth. And I'm sure that there were people that gathered together unto him at the Sea of Galilee just to wonder, what's he going to do today? And i got to be honest with you, if that's all they came for, that's probably all they got. Verse 12, for whosoever hath, to that person shall be given, and they shall have even more abundance. But whosoever doesn't have, from that person shall be taken even what they have. And I'm just going to say like this to you this morning, that how you invest your life and how what God has invested in you as to your perspective and your value has everything to do with your outcome and what is going to be your story at the end of this life that takes you into God's great eternity. You can't afford to be wrong about this. And, and I, I can tell you that from experience. You, you can't lose with the stuff I use. And I, I've tried to incorporate these ideas and these truths. These are, these are life's lessons and doctrines and if you put them to practice in your life, you can't help but come up with success and blessing. He says, therefore, I speak to them in parables because they see, but they don't see. Uh, they hear, but they don't hear. They don't understand. They don't get it. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing you shall hear and not understand. By seeing you shall see and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross. It's become heavy. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they've closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And understand with their hearts and should be converted and I should heal. He's saying it's not going to happen because they're not interested. And to them, it's just a story about planting a garden, and who cares? But blessed are your eyes. Are you getting this? Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things that you see, to hear those things that you hear, and they haven't seen them, nor have they heard them. So let me explain this story to you. 
And, and by the way, this story is also told in the, in the Gospel of Luke. And it, it's really kind of interesting that as Jesus begins to explain the parable of the sower, the first thing that he says is, the seed is the, is the word of God. So in a way, this parable is somewhat of an allegory. Uh, the seed is the word of God. Okay, we've got the seed, and, and it's good seed. You expect good seed to do well. The seed is the word of God. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, verse 19, and doesn't understand it, then comes the wicked one. Remember the birds that came and turned what was intended for growth to become bird seed? Then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was planted in their heart. This is the one, this is where the seed fell upon the pathway. And I gotta be honest, I mean, you know this, that on the day of harvest, Many weeks and months later, that seed had been digested a long time ago by some silly bird, and there wasn't anything as what you saw in that cob of corn I handed around that would benefit the person who had sown the seed, the Word of God. This is the person by the wayside. He that received the Word in stony places... That's the person who hears the word and right away is excited. They say, oh, I like this. They get excited about it. They receive it. And yet, rather than taking it into their life and allowing it to become a part of them, we use the word sometimes part and parcel. <laughs> and we're talking about parcels of ground here. They don't have any root in themselves. They haven't allowed a place in their life for that seed to take root. And I want you to know that if there's no root, there's no fruit. And what happened? Troubles and trials and persecutions come about because of the word. Somebody says, you go to church. You listen to that Jesus stuff. And they make fun again. They want to talk to you about the latest hockey game or whatever. Now, there's nothing wrong with talking about a hockey game, but I want you to know that when people mock the word of God and when they give no place in their life for the good seed to be able to take root, that it might bear fruit, and they become offended by it, which means knocked off their feet by it, by the offense, um, nothing happens that was intended to happen with that good seed. The person that received the seed amongst thorns is the person who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. And, and you might say, well, wait a minute, how could money be a problem? Well, when you get my age, just go out and buy an extra car that you don't need. And if you've ever been stuck with a car that you couldn't get rid of and it cost you a battery and a couple of tires after a while, and then this and that and the other thing, and you're going like, I don't know why I even bought that thing. And it takes up more time than you've got to spend with it. Mice get into the, into the fabric of the, you, you find that, that just, that it's, it's like the car self-destructs. Now I want you to know that if you've got a whole lot more than what you need, of what you have becomes a problem. So when you travel through these areas of town where there's these huge houses and all of this stuff, remember this, that besides enjoying living in a great big spacious bedroom that's as big as this, as this sanctuary, those people also have upkeep and care and gardening to do and painting of trim and all of the other stuff that comes with owning this monstrous house and riches will suck the life out of you. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word. And that individual bears no fruit. But the one who receives seed into the good ground is the person who hears the word and understands it, which means they probably ask a bunch of questions. 
And that seed that has gotten deep into their experience and into their lives bears forth fruit and brings, like you saw in that cop of corn, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirtyfold. And I don't know about you, but I think it makes the most sense to shoot for the shoot for a hundred percent. And your little investment, the really the investment that God has placed in your heart and into your life blossoms forth and brings forth in abundance that people go like, wow, I can't believe the change in that individual's life since they came to Jesus. I have a, a portion of scripture that I quote. If you can imagine this, there's two things that I do every morning. I, I, I pray and I get into the word. Um, but I, I always pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy, thy kingdom come. Ah, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our debts as we forgive our those who trespass or our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I, I recite that prayer every morning. Not, uh, not just to go through the motions or through the words. It's, I, I try to say it with meaning and understanding. And then there's another portion of scripture that I recite every morning of my life. And it goes like this. It's from Psalm chapter 1. Hi, ladies. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. They're a bunch of failures. They're like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And then I say, Amen. Because I want that verse of scripture to, I want that to be my identity. And I don't know if you noticed as I was reciting it, it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. I don't think there's any more disappointing project than planting an apple tree and after 15, 20 years, it doesn't produce apples or at least good apples. And all of a sudden, what you intended to give you baskets full of fruit ends up seeing its trunk cut by a chainsaw and it becomes firewood. That is not what you intended at all. And I want to say to you this morning that as God looks at your life and mine, he's looking for fruit to be growing upon our boughs and branches. He's looking for you and me to make Something of the blessings that he has poured out upon us that go far beyond ourselves, reach out to others, and ultimately contribute to his everlasting kingdom. And if you don't get that, you need to read this story again and again and again and let this seed from the word of God get down deep into your heart and take root and bear fruit. Not only for the glory of God, but for your own blessing both today and eternally you know what the word of God teaches don't look at it and say this is for somebody else because every individual if you look at this allegorically every individual is a seed plot and some require a little I read a story the other day I guess I saw it on the internet the other day of a, of a young Muslim girl and she had been seeking the Lord, and it just she just wasn't it just wasn't getting to. She just she couldn't 
it, it just wasn't coming together. And somebody handed her um, that little book called, um, um, it, it's, it's by, his name is Lee Strobel, um, but it's, it's about Jesus. And she got that, anybody remember, uh, what, what's Strobel series books? No, that's, that's another one, but it's the same idea. And then she sat down, she opened that book and began to read it. And she received Jesus into her life and got saved just, just like that. She was soil. She was a seed plot that was ready. You might have some thorns and thistles in your life. You need to get them out. You may have some rocks and stoniness in your experience. You need to allow for the seed of God's word to get in there and to take root in yourself that you might be the benefactor of, that you might be the producer of, that you might bear forth much fruit. And in the end, when the eternal fruit inspector comes around and looks at your life, God is going to see in you what he intended for his word to do in your life. I pray that what we've spoken this morning will bless you and that you'll realize perhaps if nothing has ever gotten a grip, if nothing has ever quite taken hold, if nothing has ever taken root in your life, I pray that today you'll open your heart to the word of God and allow it to get deep within you so that God gets his desired result. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we're thankful for the word of God this morning. We're thankful for the good seed. There's nothing wrong with the seed. What's wrong in this whole scenario is the condition of the hearts of men. And we would just ask you, our God, today that each of us would inspect ourselves and ask that deep question, the question that the disciples were trying to get to the root of when they said, why are you talking in parables? And we pray our God that we would see for ourselves the meaning of these teachings that Jesus brought, that changed lives and gave common men the ability to have places in an eternal kingdom that shall never end. And so, Father, bless your word to our hearts. Cause us today that we will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that we would pre produce fruit to your everlasting glory. And in the end, we would hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.